Well, once again, good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday to you. As always, I hope this finds you safe, healthy, and growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. As many of you may already know, I've been working my way through a four-part teaching on Paul's prayer from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And I've been doing this on Facebook. So if you haven't seen these yet, you can access them on my own Facebook page, the Emmanuel Assembly of God Facebook page, our men's ministry Facebook page, as well as our kids ministry Facebook page. And I'd encourage you to, to take a look at them. They're, they're short, between three and five minutes long, but we are slowly working our way through Paul's prayer for those Ephesians. And it's a great prayer that we can be praying ourselves for ourselves, our families, our friends, our churches, for our community, so on and so forth. Well, through that study, I have mentioned to you that that prayer in Ephesians is one of many different prayers that Paul prayed in his letters in the New Testament. For instance, another one of his prayers was found in the book of Philippians. And in this prayer, he prays that they would abound more and more in love. And as they are growing and abounding in love, it would give them insight into what is really of value on earth, what is excellent, what is vital, pure, and blameless. And as they're growing in that love, they'll also be filled with the fruit of righteousness, ultimately resulting in praise and glory to God. I encourage you to find that prayer in the book of Philippians. Read it for yourself. And along with the prayer in Ephesians, begin to pray that over our church, over your families, over your communities, these types of things. Well, there's another prayer that Paul prayed, and that's what I want to look at here this morning. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. So if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and turn there now. If you don't, no sweat, we'll go ahead and read it, and then we'll come back and we'll pick it apart. So here it is, Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. It's another great prayer from the Apostle Paul. And when you look at it, the prayer is really centered on knowing God's will. The Amplified Version translates that as having the full knowledge of God's will, which is great because we don't want just a little of it, right? We want to know his will in its fullness. And so everything else we're going to talk about here today will flow from that context, will flow from that understanding of knowing God's will. And before we jump into it, let's take a look at what Paul may be referencing when he speaks about knowing God's will. David Guzik, a commentator that I have quoted from many times in the past, says this, Paul is praying to know God and what he requires. And I think that's a great way to look at the heart of this prayer. And it gives us a great insight into what it means when Paul speaks of God's will. You know, in the book of Ephesians, in that prayer that I'm going through right now on Facebook, in verse 17, Paul prays that God would send forth his spirit of wisdom and revelation that they would know him better. And as I mentioned earlier, or late last week, I should say, that is centered on relationship, that we would know God and we would know him better. So it's about relationship and growing in that relationship, right? Getting to know him better. That means we know him more, we know him better now than we did say two years ago. And so Paul prays that they would know God. Not only that, but he also prays that they, they would know the hope that is theirs in Christ Jesus, 
that they would fully understand that they, the Ephesian believers, and all of us as believers, are God's inheritance, and that they would fully understand and realize the power of God that lives within them. Folks, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So there's four things that Paul lists in that prayer in Ephesians that really speak to knowing God's will. Well, let's go ahead and add to that list if we could. You all know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, doesn't, uh, or don't you? Well, he absolutely does. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, pl uh, plans for a hope and a future. So obviously, God has plans for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. And those plans include things like where to go to college, who you should marry someday, what career you should have, where you should live. All of those things are very important to God. And you see this in the scriptures. For instance, um, the Bible talks a lot about marriage. <laughs> God is interested in your marriage and he's interested if you're single and who you're going to marry. In the book of James, it talks about God's interest in your work and how we ought to be praying, God, where do you want us to work? How are you leading us in this way? The Apostle Paul had a very specific calling in his life. Here's where I want you to be. Here's how I'm leading you, so on and so forth. So all of these things are very important to God and therefore they should be important to us. But God's will is more than just these types of things. It's really about who we are in him and how we are to live our lives day by day as disciples. Listen to how Ray Stedman says it. He says, therefore, the primary course in the curriculum of the spirit is to learn who you are now, what God has made you to be, and especially your new relationship to him. This is beautifully captured in a verse we consider so important, we have written it right across the front of our auditorium. Of course, he is referencing the auditorium in which he preached at decades ago in his church. And here's the scripture. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. You are no longer, be, or you no longer belong to yourself, so you are no longer to live for yourself. Your will, your pleasure, your comfort are no longer to be primary in your life but what God calls you to be and what he has made you to be. <clears throat> the more you understand who you are now and what God has done to make you that, the more your behavior will change automatically. Now listen, we could probably spend the next hour or so on this quote alone. But for now, realize that he paints a great picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not so much what our will is anymore. For us, it's what God's will is. It's not necessarily what we desire, but what God desires. It's not necessarily our plans for our lives. It's God's plans for our lives. And so Paul understood this himself and he prays that they would fully know the will of God in their lives. And let's remember something here. Once we know the will of God, we are to carry it out, right? It's one thing to know what God has for us. It's a whole other thing to live it out. You know who's a great example of this is Jesus himself. And I think I referenced this in another message I gave just recently. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was off praying by himself. Now keep in mind, he fully knew what God's will was. That is God the Father's will for him. Of course, that will ultimately was the cross. And as he was praying, well, that was the night before he was to be crucified. So here he is, knowing full well that tomorrow the cross awaits him. And he prays to his Father in heaven, in essence saying, Dad, I don't want to do this. If there's anywhere, any way else that I could save the world, let's do it. I don't want to go to the cross. And of course, it makes sense because Jesus knew what the cross was, the pain and the suffering for him, not just in a physical way, but also 
in a very spiritual way, which is a whole other topic. <clears throat> so here he is. He fully knows God's will. He says, I don't want to do it. But then he comes around and he says, ultimately what? Not my will be done, but your will be done. So there it is. Jesus knew God's will. He then lived it out. And of course, I think that's what's being insinuated here when we, Paul is talking about God's will. He's praying that we, well, specifically the Colossian believers, but really this is a prayer for all of us as disciples of Jesus, would know God's will. And of course, the other side of that coin is that we would then live it out. So the question then we've got to answer is, how do you come to a place where you know God's will? You know, I love these theological truths in the Bible, these deep teachings. But I'm also very interested, as was the Apostle Paul, along with Jesus himself too, how do you get there, right? The Bible says something, and that's great. But the Bible isn't just about knowing things, it's about how to get to that point, right? It's a very practical thing, in other words. So how do you get to know God's will for your life? Is it magic? You know, do you just watch Penn and Teller and all of a sudden, boom, God is going to speak? Does it happen through some type of hocus pocus? Or maybe it's osmosis. You know, you take the Bible, you put it under your pillow when you're sleeping at night, and somehow the Bible just sort of seeps into your being. Is that how it happens? Well, obviously, the answer to all of these is, is no. But Paul gives us the answer. And you find the answer back in verse 9 again. Listen to it. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, and here it is, through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Did you catch that? <clears throat> Those Colossian believers would know God's will for their lives through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So let's pick this apart a little bit here if we could. What does Paul mean when he uses the phrase spiritual wisdom? Well, he's simply talking about wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to read it here this morning, but for those of you who love to dig deeper into the Bible, and I hope it's all of you, um, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 through 10 and then verse 13 speaks about this at length. And if I was to sum it up, Paul is talking about <clears throat> spiritual wisdom or wisdom from the Spirit versus wisdom from man. See, men's wisdom, men's reasonings will never get us to a place where we can fully understand God's will. It's got to be given through spiritual wisdom by the Holy Spirit. Okay, Stedman says it like this. In 1 Corinthians, the apostle contrasts these two. That is the wisdom of the spirit versus the wisdom of the flesh or the natural man. Saying our ministry is not according to the wisdom of man, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. He goes on to say we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. Paul is speaking of divine insights into human life how to understand ourselves and how the world functions, which God reveals, but of which natural man knows nothing, no matter how well educated he may be. So if you want to know God's will, it has to be through the Holy Spirit. It has to be the Spirit revealing it to us and not our own reasoning, not our own knowledge, our flesh or our natural man, as the Bible would call it. So a key here is that we would learn to lock into the Holy Spirit. And again, I am going to beat the old dead horse because I say this so often. And, and I guess it's a good thing because I know for me, I need the reminder. And I'm assuming you probably need the reminder here and there as well. But folks, we have to get away with God. We've got to have our Bibles open. We have to be in an attitude of praise and worship and prayer where it's just us and God giving the Holy Spirit the opportunity to speak into our lives. And as I said, I think when we uh, were talking about Paul's prayer and knowing God better a couple of days ago, I think it was last Thursday, um, 
Also be on the lookout for how the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you throughout the day. You know, there are times in your day when you're going about your business and the Holy Spirit breaks in. I've been there. I've experienced that. And I'm sure many of you have as well. So lock into the Holy Spirit. Spending that time in the silence and solitude, absolutely. But also being on the lookout for how the Holy Spirit may be speaking throughout your day, regardless of where you are and what you're doing. Well, Paul also uses a second word here, and that word is understanding, right? All spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we've got to ask ourselves another question, don't we? Is there a difference between spiritual wisdom and understanding? Or is Paul basically saying the same thing in different ways? Well, there is actually a difference. See, understanding is taking God's wisdom and applying it to certain situations. Barclay, William Barclay says like this, so when Paul prays that his friends may have wisdom and understanding, he is praying that they may understand the great truths of Christianity, that is God's will, and may be able to apply them to the tasks and decisions which meet them in everyday living. Which harkens back to what I said just a moment ago. Not only do we want to know God's will for our lives, but we also want to carry it out. We want to apply his will to how we're living throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the months, so on and so forth. And I think it's a great, it's a great way to look at it. The Holy Spirit's going to give you all that wisdom you need, right? He's also going to give you the understanding in how to use it as you face your day. A great example of this is found in Proverbs chapter seven. King Solomon was looking out over the city and he was watching a young man walk down this certain road. Well, King Solomon knew that there was an adulteress, a known adulteress it seems, who lived on that road. So there's a good possibility that the young man walking down that road also knew of this, but either way, he kept on his way. And sure enough, the woman must have seen him through the window, comes out to the road and begins to seduce him. And at first he is fighting against it, but he finally gives in, he goes into her house and they sleep together as her husband is away on business. Well, King Solomon is like, man, this guy totally blew it. He was not walking in wisdom. And I would say to you, he should never have walked past her house, especially at that time of night in the first place. And there's no doubt this young man knew that it was wrong, but then he fell anyway. I think it's a good illustration. We can know something right? Spiritual wisdom. But now we need to have that understanding from the spirit in how to apply it to our lives. I should probably not walk down that road. I should probably not be on the computer by myself this time of day. I should probably do this. I should probably react like this. Here's the decision we need to make. You see, that's understanding. So it's through spiritual wisdom and understanding how to apply that wisdom that we've get to know the full knowledge of God's will and begin to apply it to our lives. Pretty cool, isn't it? Well, let's take a look then at the results of what happens when we know and grow, and I would say apply the full wisdom of God or the full knowledge of God. The first thing is we will live a life worthy of God and please him in every way. Let's read verse 10 again, the first part. It says that we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. <laughs> I know I'm laughing because I basically just didn't summarize that part of the verse. I just said the verse. It's an interesting thing. Um, we want to walk worthy, in other words, of our calling. Ray Stedman says it like this. When you understand what God has made you to be, though you don't deserve it at all, 
his child cherished by him, your guilt and sin taken care of, and that God is your loving father who protects you, guides and guards you. And when you see him in all his majesty and beauty, then you will become concerned about whether your behavior reflects his beauty and what others will think of your God when they are watching you. That is a life worthy of the Lord. This is the first thing we are to be concerned about, our impact upon others, how our lives are impacting theirs, and what our actions make them think about our God. Woo! Again, we could probably spend about an hour or so here on this uh, second quote from Ray Stedman. But here's the deal. When we know the full, uh, have full knowledge of the will of God, through spiritual understanding or spiritual wisdom and understanding, then we will begin to live a life worthy of God and we will please him in every way. And this brings up a very interesting point. And you may have heard this before, but when people see you as a disciple of Jesus, they are going to see God. We're representatives of him. We are his children. And so it's so important for us to know the full will of God, right? Why? Because we want to live it out. It's a witness. It's a witness. And in doing so, we are pleasing God in every way, whether people are watching or not, which adds another dimension to it, doesn't it? Yeah, Stedman really focuses on when they see us, they see God. Okay, so we want to make sure we're living in a life uh, or living in a way that reflects God's life in and through us. But even when we are by ourselves, we want to live a life pleasing to God and walk worthy of him. I've heard it said that character is what you do and no one is watching. <laughs> that might be scary to some of us. I know it scares me sometimes because I know that there are times when I lack. I thank God for his grace, but still. As we are growing in the full knowledge of God through spiritual wisdom and understanding, I believe this will happen more and more and more in our lives. Do you see why this is such an important prayer to be praying? Huh? For yourselves, your family members, the church. This is God's heart for us. So we will live a life worthy of his calling, pleasing him in every way. And then two, we will also bear fruit in every good work. Let's go back to verse 10 again. Uh, it says, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Hmm. You know, in John chapter 15, Jesus himself has chosen us as his followers, and he's appointed us as his followers, really, to bear good fruit. Fruit that lasts. And so I started thinking about different types of fruit that the Bible mentions. And I'm not talking about apples or pears or whatever, but I'm talking about things like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. John the Baptist mentions the fruit of repentance, a changed life, a life of purity, in other words, instead of a life of sin. Those are the two prominent ones. But there's also another one that I've heard taught uh, many times over the years, and that is bearing the fruit of souls. In other words, are we living our lives in such a way that not only do they see Jesus in us, but people are coming to know Jesus through us. In essence, that's bearing fruit as well as we add to God's kingdom of grace. So, as we grow in this full knowledge of God's will, spiritual understand or spiritual wisdom and understanding, we will live a life worthy of him, pleasing him in all things. We will bear fruit in every good work. And then, as we go to verses 11 and 12, we will be strengthened with all power. Listen to this again. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. So, glorious might. Right? We see that phrase. We see the word power here. 
I believe we saw the word power here. Yeah, all power according to his glorious might. Sometimes Paul says so many things that I have to go back and check and make sure I'm not making things up. You see, when you're talking about the glorious might, you're talking about power. We're talking about the power of God himself, right? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, as we find in Ephesians chapter 1, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's power. When we talk about mighty, uh, glorious might, that reminds me also of mighty strength. I also believe found in Ephesians chapter 1. You see, in Christ, we are over every rule and principality and authority in the heavenly realms. In other words, we, in the power of Jesus, have power over the demonic forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They are like the gum, I've said this a hundred times, on the bottom of Jesus' shoe. Well, we are seated in Christ and his mighty strength is in us. And if he is over every rule and authority, so are you and so, are I, so am I. So I would encourage you to realize and understand that this power lives in you. Let it out by living out God's will. For your life, pleasing him in every way, being filled with that spiritual wisdom and understanding. Huh, it's good stuff. And when you're living out God's power and might, it leads to two things that Paul says here. The first is it leads to great endurance and patience. We just read this in, in verses 11 and 12. You know as well as I do, I mean, Again, I feel like a broken record, like I'm beating the dead horse, but this life ain't always easy. There are many times when you actually have to endure through things. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're really large. God's power and might in, through, in you gives you the strength to endure. It gives you the strength to be patient in the midst of struggles and temptations and trials. When your faith is being tested, when your marriage is being tested, when your finances are being tested, maybe when you're being tested by persecution, I don't know. God will give you that strength to endure by his very own power and might. And then as we are living out this, this life of power and might in the spirit, we will joyfully give thanks to God. So, here's a personal question for each one of you watching this today. I don't care your age, your background. It's a great question. How many of you want these things in your lives? How many of you want to live a life worthy of God and pleasing to Him? How many of you want to bear good fruit in whatever you're doing? How many of you would like to grow in the knowledge of God through all spiritual wisdom and understanding? How many of you would desire for the power of God in your life leading to great patience and endurance and praise bubbling out of you? How many of you truly want those things? You know, we could give lip service to this and say, oh yeah, that's, that's what I want. But deep down, how many of you really want that? And the reason I ask it is because we can have them. And we can have them when the Holy Spirit is giving us that spiritual wisdom that we need, that understanding of how to put that wisdom into action. Not only will we know God's will, more and more in our lives as we continue on with him. But all of these other things will begin to bubble out as well. Folks, you can't work yourself to it. You can't be a good enough person for it. You can't give enough money to the church for it. It comes through the full knowledge of God's will, through spiritual wisdom and understanding. My prayer for us, well, my prayer for us is Paul's prayer. Let me go ahead and pray over you and your family today, if I could. Father, going back to Jeremiah 29, verse 11, we know that you have good plans, great plans for us. 
So Lord, we ask now that you would give us, you would help us to know the full knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And Lord, out of that, all of these other things would flow too. We would live a life worthy of you and please you. We would bear good fruit. We would have power, patience, and endurance, and we would give worship and thanks and glory to you for who you are, what you've done, and what you're continuing to do in our lives. I pray this right now over every person who is watching, their households, their families. Lord, bless them with these things even now. And if there's anyone watching here today that does not know you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would put their faith in you you would take away their sins, and instead of judgment, they would have eternal life, which is life everlasting in your presence. No more death, no more tears, no more loss, anxiety, depression. <sighs> the devil himself is banished. Father, that's our blessed hope. And I pray for those who don't know you, that they would put their faith in you today, and that that blessed hope would be theirs. But Lord, give us full knowledge of your will and help us to walk in it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Sunday and have a blessed week.